This morning we plan to kick things off as we talk about looking out for our children. It is the holiday period and uh, many of you may be tempted to leave your kids by strangers, neighbors, that trusting uncle or aunt. But let's look a little bit deeper into it. What are the do's and don'ts? The Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago is a specialized agency with the responsibility for the care and protection of our children, especially those who are at risk or have been victims of abuse or even neglect. And here to tell us about the organization as well as to discuss some issues facing our children is the chairman of the Children's Authority, Hanif Benjamin. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for having us. It's wonderful having you this morning. My first question to you, what are some of the responsibilities of the Children's Authority? Well, as you so aptly pointed out a short while ago, we are overall responsible for care and protection for all children in Trinidad and Tobago. And when I say all children, I'm referring to children, whether you were born here or you came by Trinidad and Tobago, um, whether it is by trafficking or any other means. Under the Convention of the Rights of the Child, the Children's Authority, has a mandate to provide care and protection for all children in Trinidad and Tobago. But more specifically, what our mandate tells us is that we receive and investigate reports um, of mistreatment of children. So that's the number one. We receive and investigate reports. Um, and I, I want to point out that the investigation is not a police investigation, rather it's a social investigation. Um, we don't find guilt or innocence. Right? We investigate whether there is need for care and protection for children. We manage the foster care and adoption process, the only agency within Trinidad and Tobago with that responsibility, again, um, by Act of Parliament, established standards for community residences, foster care, and nurseries. So what we do, in fact, is we license these, um, what we used to call children's home, now community residences, foster care, and nurseries. We monitor children register residences, foster care, and nurseries, so we monitor as well. So we go in from time to time to ensure that the standards that are set are being kept. Um, we provide support to the child justice system. You know that the Children's Court recently opened, and we are a key player in that um, realm as well. Um, and as well as providing assistance to the counter trafficking unit in the protect respect the child victim, of course, and working very closely as well with the child protection unit of the police service. So those are some of the core mandates of the Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. So you mentioned uh, it's not a police investigation per se, but it's a social investigation. But at what point in time would the police get involved? The police could be involved before, during, and after, right? Because we get reports from all sources. We get reports from anonymous calls, from walking to the agency, from social media, we see it and we get involved. Or the police can call us and say, hey, we are on a case and we need the Children's Authority involvement. Um, or we can get involved and realize that there is some level of criminality and get the police involved. So the police can be involved at any and all stages of the investigation. But what I want people to understand, that is two separate and distinct investigation that happens. So we go into figure out whether there is need for care and protection. For example, if a child is reported to be sexually abused, we would take the child to get medical and stuff, and once it is substantiated, then the child is removed for safety or placed with a pair, or another parent or family member, you see? And so it is now the duty of the police to, to, to figure out in terms of criminal act, whether someone may have committed this act and stuff like that. So it's two separate investigation, but definitely we work hand in hand. And you would remember um, our child assessment center where our children are being assessed. And uh, this is where it's a, a one-stop shop where both the police and the children's authority can conduct a forensic interviewing so that a child won't have to repeat their story over and over and over. So that is one of the, the very close-knit ways that we work together. Now, you spoke about mistreatment of mm -hmm. children. How would you define that and what are the various uh, types of mistreatment? So we're talking about all level of abuse, you know, basically. And when it is sexual abuse, neglect, physical abuse, whatever it is, once we realize that a child is not being treated the way a child should be treated, more so by the act as well as the convention, we can step in. 
once we realize that the child is being mistreated and that mis maltreatment can form physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, whatever it is, we would step in. And at what point in time do you determine that the solution is foster care? Well, before we can even get to foster care, we need to determine whether or not there's risk. So there's an assessment for risk. Um, and the risk involves whether or not if this child stays in the environment, the child will be further harmed. Once we have identified risk, we move into who can we place this child with? Because you will appreciate removing a child from a home in itself is a traumatic situation. And so as far as humanly possible, we try not to remove a child from their home, okay. unless, of course, the risks are high. Now, once we have noticed that there's a risk, we will look within the family system to see if we can place this child within the family circle. When that has failed, then we look to foster care, right, to see whether we can place the child with a loving family. And if that doesn't pan out, then we look to the community residences to place a child. But definitely we look at risk, we mitigate the risk, and then we go down the ladder. Because the closer the child is to home and to people they know and love, the faster the, the healing will occur. How would you define a risky environment? Well, a risk is defined by whether or not a child is in, Im in Im imminent danger. Once you're in imminent danger, that is risky. We will never leave a child in a situation where they can be further harmed. You see, we would like for a child not to be harmed. But if we go into a situation where a child is, is harmed, we, we, we look and see whether there is a perpetrator in the house, whether the social environment that surrounds the child is able to manage whatever is happening there. And once we determine that that cannot be provided, then we go into moving into the second phase and the third and the fourth phase. How do we intervene in a risky environment to make it less risky? Well, our emergency response team, which is a 24-hour team and our investigatory team, they are dispatched once they get a call and the call is assessed for risk or whatever it is, whether it's a call, the police comes, we assess it for risk and we go out immediately. Um, and when they go out, they assess, again, the social environment for the level of support that the child can get and they assess the, what is going on with the child as well. And that is when we determine what are the next steps. For example, you could very well find a child being taken straight to the hospital, right, or, or, or to a safe place, uh, one of our hidden locations, because the child needs to be protected. And so the investigation team will make that determination um, when they go out into the field. All right, when we talk about removing children from homes, mm -hmm. if it comes to that, you may have siblings as well, and uh, some children may not really want to be separated how would you deal with something like that? Well, not only are they, you know, they don't want to be separated, but we wouldn't want to separate them either. Okay. Right? Again, part of the risk and mitigating the risk is also beyond the abuser. Huh? When you remove a child, that in itself is risky. And so you don't want to add more trauma on top of the trauma. And so as far as humanly possible, we try to keep siblings together. Because we understand that that is a frightening time and we, we don't want to put further psychological pressure on a child. And so keeping children together is our major goal. What role does counselling play in all of this, whether it be for the kids, the parents and those involved? Counselling is a critical um, and integral part of our operation. Um, our children receive counselling in-house and if needs be for more specialised type of counselling, it is referred um, but counseling is an integral part. Um, you would appreciate that the Children's Authority has a multidisciplinary um, process where it's not only counseling, but you have medical doctors, psychiatrists, um, social workers, um, a whole group of people, um, professionals that can work with a child once a child is removed, um, or even whether or not you're removed, but once a child has been flagged, uh, our machinery will kick into place and all of these other professionals would get involved. Let's talk statistics. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about child abuse statistics or even, as you said, incidents of mistreatment. Mm -hmm. how, how does it look in Trinidad and Tobago? <sighs> it's not good. It's not good. It's not good. And that is why the Children's Authority is really pushing not only um, to deal with the cases that are before us, but preventative work as well. I mean, we have been partnering with the Office of the Prime Minister, our line ministry, 
is also very much engaged in the protective and um, preventative type of work because we must see that there is a serious problem in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, from the, 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 the inception of the authority to now, we have seen over 15,000 um, cases uh, of children in need and protection, over 15,000. Now, that comes out of over 50,000 calls. You see? So when you get a cause, you will decipher, you know, what are the cases to act on, um, stuff like that. But we're talking about over 15,000 calls of child abuse. And you would also appreciate that the world is saying for every one case of child abuse, um, we have four that is not reported. For this small population, this is a travesty. This is a travesty on our children. And so we are seeing almost 5,000 cases per year on an average of cases. I'm not just talking about calls. Huh? I'm talking about cases where the Children's Authority must intervene. And to me, as a chairman, that is very, very, very worrying. Very, very worrying. And so you're talking about, you know, 500 cases per month on an average. And when you look further at the disaggregated data, you're talking about 56% of the reported cases accounted for female, 41% are of male. And, 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 and I want the country and, uh, and the public to know that when we're talking about abuse, it's not just females. Because look how close the numbers are here. 56 reported are females and 41% are males. And when you look at the age break, I mean, we have cases from baby all the way up. But the higher concentration we're talking about between the ages of 10 to 13, right? And that accounts for 22.7% of the age group of children reported to the authority. So when you look at the demographics and also the, 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 the age of, of, of these children being abused, you're talking about from baby all the way up, but there is a serious concentration between the 10 to 13. So it means that our work must also be uh, um, informed by the data that we receive. And so you find that we're a lot now into primary schools and post-primary mm -hmm. school, you know, that age bracket. And also, what you find the team, our communication team is doing is really going out there to really talk to the younger kids as well. Because we need to get people educated about what is abuse. Yes. But, but, but what is very instructive for us to know? In San Juan Lavantil Administrative District is 13% of the abuse, which is the highest. Tuna Puna Piaco accounted for 12.5% of the reported case. Kuva Tabaki Paro accounted for 9.4%. Right? Uh, those are alarming figures as well. Our sexual abuse accounted for 26.8%. Sexual abuse. Neglect is 24.1%. And physical abuse is 16.2%. Those numbers are of the chart numbers. Sexual abuse, 26.8%. It means that our children are being abused on a daily basis. And I want to go a step further because the highest perpetrators of abuse, when you look at the data, are that of mothers. 40% of all perpetrators of child abuse reported are mothers. And it tells us, and I know we are commissioning a study to really examine what are some of the real reasons for this? I mean, we could uh, gesticulate as to what might some of those reasons be. For example, mothers are in fact the head of households, so they interact with children a lot. Um, single parents, stressful situation, lack of support for single parents. So we can speak to a lot of reasons why, but we want to study because we want to be accurate so that when we create programs or partner with people out there to provide programs, we know what we're targeting. Right, but at the end of the day, it is saying to us that the numbers, the numbers are saying that our children are at peril here. That is what the numbers are saying to us. And for the authority, it is quite worrying because we are seeing a steady hold in numbers of abuse every year, about 5,000 cases. And to me, that is something that must change. Not because I don't want people to report, but I want people educated. I want children educated. Because to be quite honest with you, when you look at some of the reports, it's simply that they don't know that this is abuse. Because that is what they lived, and their parents lived, and so everybody thinks that it's okay to do it. And so at the authority, we must say to people, no, this is abuse. You see, we grew up in a situation where the 14 year old have to see about the 10, 9, 8, 7, 6 year olds. And so the parent goes out to work and leaves that. Oh, that is neglect. 
That is neglect. But for some, they wouldn't understand that concept. Mm -hmm. And so it is the role of the authority to go out there and to educate people, educate our school system, educate our community, our churches, our faith base, so that everyone knows what is abuse and what they can do to combat the scourge of this abuse on our most vulnerable. So the 14-year-old who is left responsible to supervise the younger siblings, that is illegal. That is illegal. That is illegal. And I know people would say, you know, but, but mom have to go to work and dad have to go to work, so what would you do? I understand those circumstances. But when something happens, as we have seen in this country, where children who are supervising children are left to their own devices, we have had death, we have had injuries, what then do we do? We must understand that our children are the most vulnerable and they require supervision. They require supervision. And if we don't put things in place to supervise them, then we are held responsible as the adult. And so parents must understand that fact. Now, you mentioned something. You said that um, you all have been doing your investigations to determine what could contribute to this sort of behavior that would lead to the statistics, as you said, 500 cases per month. Mm -hmm. One thing that you, you identified, as you mentioned, is that single parents. Right. Do you think there are other factors that would contribute? Of course, of course there are many other factors. Um, we need to understand, I think, we need to understand the whole terminology of child abuse. I think we need to understand it because I think that a lot of us, we, we walk around thinking that this abuse is, is just sexual abuse. Many of our children are abused by the people who are entrusted to protect them. That is an alarming fact and that is throughout the world. Children are abused by people they know and trust. And so we're talking about people who are grooming children, you see, and now that is part of the law. Grooming is against the law and you can be charged for grooming. We find that parents are leaving children unsupervised with other people without taking into account that these people might be perpetrators upon children. We're talking about parents not taking an active role in understanding their children. That too is a major problem. So also not developing that voice allowing your child or children to be able to come to you and say hey x happened this happened and so you would find that a big part of our work is helping parents to open that line of communication to be more vigilant with their children so so you should know your child baseline you should know what the child gives and if the child was going to x home or visiting x people or person and now they are no longer interested they no longer want to go. They're fighting. You need to stop and take a look. You see, why it is that this child no longer wants to go by this person? Even in our daycares, all of these places, you must be vigilant. You must take an active role. You must be able to examine that of your children's body. I find sometimes, you know, parents will be bathing your children um, probably up until a particular age, and then you stop, you know. I am saying that parents need to be very vigilant. I'm not saying you have to be, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 going up the road. But from time to time, you should be able to examine your children's body. You should, because even, even when, uh, for example, you have had a child very open, and all of a sudden now the child is hiding and, and, and very um, shy about their bodies and don't want you to come into the room, you need to take stock of some of these things because those things are real. But sometimes we take the hands-off approach and we allow abuse to happen. Now, there are two things that I want to say. One, sometimes we cannot stop abuse. But on the flip side to that, we can stop it from happening for a long time. And too many of our children are abused for years. And that should never be. If an abuse happens, which is unfortunate and should never happen, we can get to that. But to allow that abuse to happen for years, it means that we are not seeing something. And as parents, as leaders, as teachers, we need to be able to educate ourselves to know the signs and symptoms, what to look for, what not to look for, what's going on, so that we could stop the abuse from being perpetrated onto our children for years. 
How can persons contact the authority if they need Definitely to? Definitely 800 2014. 800 2014 is a toll free number. How confidential are these reports? Beyond confidential. It's so confidential that people get upset sometimes because you know you would call in a report and then you will call back a week later to get an update. Unfortunately, I cannot give you an update. And so, you know, unfortunately, you'll go to the media and say, well, I reported a case and they don't want to tell me anything. But we must take these cases confidential because we want people to report and we don't want people to feel as if they will be stereotyped, you see, or, or victimized. So our reports are quite confidential. They can call 800-2014-99 or 996, toll-free numbers. They can send an email to info at ttchildren.org. And I want to put a plug here because you would have recognized that people are posting videos on social media. And that is also against the law. That is also against the law. But if you send information to info at ttchildren.org, you are then exempt from that law because you are sending it to the authority undercover. You see? So I want to encourage people to stop posting the things on Facebook and social media and send it to our email. Or you can send it to registry at ttchildren.org. Registry at ttchildren.org or info at ttchildren.org. You can call 800-2014 or 996. I also want to encourage Trinidad and Tobago eh, to really go on our website. Okay. Go on our website and become familiar not only with the legislation that we are mandated to provide. You see? Go and get the information about child abuse. We have a lot of information there, as well as Facebook. We are posting daily. You see, send questions if you have questions to the Facebook page, right? www.ttchildren.org. I really want you to take today and go on our website and, and, and become a Kura. See what's going on. Understand the statistics. Understand where and understand what you can do as an individual, as a company, as a group, as a church to help us fight because one of the major things here is that we cannot do it alone it was not designed for us to do it alone our stakeholders are critical in the fight against child abuse it is critical especially when you look at these crazy numbers and so we are asking all our stakeholders to come on board fbo's cbo's ngos all of that government agencies non-government whomever you may be Come on board with the Children's Authority because we are about protecting children. And that is what our mandate provides and that is what we are about. All right. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. We've been talking to Mr. Hanif Benjamin, Chairman of the Children's Authority. He invites you to take a look at their website for further information and pay attention to your children. We take a short break. A lot more when we return. Stay tuned. <laughs>